part in um, the Japan Foundation played in. So thank you to the Japan Foundation for this space and thank you to the British Council for um, enabling today's event as well. Um, I will ask that you check that your beeping devices are in silence now, please. Um, and, uh, and just to give yourself the, the space to enjoy the next hour fully. And um, so this is how it's going to go. Deborah will speak to us for 45 minutes. Um, she'll infuse her thoughts with readings from Swimming Home, from her collection of poetry, um, and also from Black Vodka, the collection of short stories. Um, I, was a bit, I was wondering if we should ask if you would tease hot milk for us, but we'll see. <laughs> so, um, so Deborah really doesn't need much introduction. She's obviously filled the room. You, you all know her as um, a, an extremely accomplished playwright, poet, um, and an author of novels and short stories, um, one of which was, um, one of the books was uh, shortlisted for, uh, for um, a man booker at Swimming Home, and we'll get to hear from that. Um, so today we're going to delve into the world of dreams, and, um, and we're going to think about how they, um, how they make their way into our reality, and for those of us that then take those realities and those thoughts and translate them into words, what happens then? And for those of us who pick up on those words when they're written, what, how, what does that experience become for us? And so Deborah will share her thoughts on that. And then there'll be some time at the end for us to, um, to throw some questions at her. Um, and uh, so that, there'll be about 15 minutes towards the end when we'll get to talk to Deborah about that. There'll be roving mics about, so pop your hand up, and someone will bring a mic to you, and, um, and you can put your questions to Deborah. After that, um, if you would just give us a couple of minutes to get Deborah settled downstairs, um, and then you can pop downstairs to the select bookshop and she will sign your books for you. So that's how the next hour or so is going to go. And um, I guess without any further ado, the person you've come to hear from, Deborah Levy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll never forget the crushing disappointment uh, when I was six years old and my mum was reading me Alice in Wonderland and we got to the end of the book and uh, Alice says, it was all a dream. Everything that happened, it was just a dream. So we have to keep this in mind as writers when um, we use a dreamlike, uh, dreamlike realities in our work. I was hoping that um, I was hoping to interview Alice in Wonderland one day and hear all about her adventures with the White Queen and the Red Queen and the Cheshire Cat. But unfortunately, it just happened between her ears. So uh, I do keep that in mind when I use dreams to disturb uh, the reality levels and the, the, the sort of um, contract that I make with my readers in my book. But one of the things we all share in this theatre today, across our cultural differences and similarities, is that we have dreams and nightmares. And we share this dreaming with our fellow humans from the beginning of time. On this earth, which in fact is just as mysterious as a dream. I learned today that butterflies taste with their teeth, with their feet. That ostriches have eyes that are bigger than their brains and cats have 32 muscles in each ear. There is no such thing as a stupid dream. We don't have to be educated to have clever dreams. We are all equal in, in, we are all equal as dreamers. Now writing is a good home for the reach of the human mind. And so my interest in dreams reflects my interest in all the dimensions of human consciousness of which dreams are part. I'm going to read to you now a poem I wrote straight from a dream it's the only time I've ever done that. Some of you might have uh, this on your chair, 
and I'd be very happy to sign it afterwards if you don't want to rip it up or give it to somebody else. And it's, uh, it's about a visit from a muse. So what is a muse? A muse is something that generally male writers and male artists um, culturally engage with. It's a woman, a beautiful woman, or a force that's personified as a woman, or it's nature. Someone who is a source of inspiration to a creative artist. So for uh, John Lennon, it was Yoko Ono. For Salvador Dali, it was Gala. But my muse, when he appeared to me in my dream, was a strange man. My muse appeared to me in a dream. I pretended not to notice when he crept up on me in Frith Street, London. I was upset, he was so ugly. <laughs> he was chasing me with soft footsteps. His shoelaces were untied. Sometimes his thick spectacles shattered. He wanted to speak to me in his big winter coat, waiting to tell me something. I was wanting to hear while he was waiting, wanting to speak to me. But though I wanted to hear, I did not want to listen, which is why he was waiting. So. My dream was telling me that I was not paying attention to something or someone that I needed to listen to, but I didn't want to do that. And I invite someone to tell me after this talk why they think his thick spectacles kept shattering. Shattering and then coming together again, and shattering and coming together again. And there's no right or wrong answer, it's just a playful game. And if you have any ideas, I'd, I'd, I'd love you to tell me. And one other thing, just to get you working very hard on, on the Sunday, if anyone has a childhood dream they remember, it can just be one line uh, or two lines, um, it would be great to hear some of those at the end of this talk, and we will call it a museum of childhood. And I do that in every, um, every place that I travel to. Um, uh, so this would be a museum of childhood Singapore. In ancient Egypt and Greece, it was believed that dreams were a visit from the gods. They came from outside ourselves rather than from within ourselves. When human beings developed a written language, they began to interpret dreams. The ancient Egyptians tried to make contact with their dream world with various rituals. They even had special dream temples where they would lie in dream beds and hope to have a dream of advice or healing, or comfort. The ancient Greeks left gifts for the gods they wished to evoke in a dream, money or food. Dreaming was a way of curing illness. People would travel to a temple, fast, sacrifice an animal, and then lie stretched on animal skins to sleep and dream. And they would describe their dream to a priest who would interpret it. It was thought that dreams were from some sort of higher power and gave guidance and understanding about the inner self or decisions to be made in the world. Hippocrates, regarded by many as the father of modern me medicine, saw dreams as important indicators of physical and mental health. So perhaps this was the first time there was a realization that dreams come like night visitors from human thoughts. 
So almost no important work of ancient literature lacks reference to dreams, their interpretation, and their influence on human attitudes <coughs> and actions. Dream interpretation was the responsibility of those with experience in such things, and in many cultures still is, tribal elders, matriarchs, patriarchs, priests, and shamans. Shamans gave especially valuable advice, since they were believed to be able to enter the world of dreams at will through ecstatic trances to encounter the souls of humans and other beings, to fight to recover lost souls, to heal and to bring back meaning from the quest. So one of the um, most well-known visionaries, and I know a vision isn't quite the same thing as a dream, um, is the English poet William Blake. And William Blake, when he was eight years old, used to walk across uh, an expanse of green called Peckham Rye in South London. And he'd look up at trees, and he'd see that they were crammed with angels. And he came home, and he told his mother and father, the trees were crammed with angels today. And they said, don't tell lies, William. And they got a bit worried about their son. They didn't put him through normal schooling because <laughs> they thought he'd be bullied. So he was educated at home. And I was thinking about William Blake and his visions when I wrote this collection of poetry called An Amorous Discourse in the Suburbs of Hell. And what it is, inspired by William Blake, is that I've imagined an angel has flown into a North London suburb and landed on the doormat of an accountant. So she's got ragged, uh, it's been a long journey, uh, wide wings, and she's always hovering um, a few inches above the ground, and she has to sort of get in through his door. And it's a conversation uh, between the two of them uh, so when I read he, that's the accountant, and when I read she, that's the angel. And I thought I'd give you a taste of it. So this is he. There you are, all wonderful and winged and leaking that smile. Let me in. Want to walk through snowstorms burning for you, peeling oranges for you, shivering and shimmering, my assured modern woman. Who are you, anyway? She, I have come to save you from the suburbs of hell, to rub my skin against the regularity of your habits, to bend your thoughts like a spoon, to find your memories lost in software, dived like a thought out of paradise into your acrylic arms. He, uninvited, you flew into my semi and ate all my daffodils. I woke up to your starry tattoos, fingers tangled in your hair. I asked you to stay. Now you make incense from my heart and liver, spit mean small feathers at my good intentions. And so it goes on, and it becomes a conversation about love and about, um, and about dreaming and about belief and, um, and men and women. Probably what we don't share in the 21st century is the way we culturally interpret dreams or what we think dreams are for. But we might have culturally translatable internal conflicts that we share. A wish to love and be loved, to be respected and valued, angry feelings, anxieties, difficulties in families, memories of childhood. And sometimes when we sleep, dreams open the door to 
demons. They show us a sometimes crazy view of how we are really feeling and what it is we fear. Dreams appear to transport us to another world, but often they transport us to the world inside us, totally transformed into pictures and into sounds and into growls, into voices we don't recognize. It's a film that we perhaps are directing. So, what has this got to do with writing fiction in the 21st century? The late great British writer, J.G. Ballard, uh, he wrote many dystopian novels of which I am a great, I'm a great admirer of Jim's work. In the early days, um, in the 1950s, when he started to write short stories, his work was published as science, as science fiction. And then he said, well, you know what? I'm more interested in inner worlds than in inner life than outer space. And um, somehow he managed to cross over into um, out of, he, got, he got himself out of science fiction, not that there's anything wrong with science fiction, gave him a space for his ideas. But it was very interesting that this writing could only be published um, in that genre to begin with. Anyway, when asked what motivated him to write in the way that he did, he said this. So this is Jim J.G. Ballard. I try to find the unconscious logic that runs below the surface and look for the hidden wiring. It's as if there are all these strange lights and I'm looking for the wiring in the fuse box. Well, this feels very close to the ways in which I approach the art forms I work across, these being literature, theatre and visual culture, and Ballard is also taking a lead from Sigmund Freud, the father of European psychoanalysis. There will be many fathers and there will be many mothers in other cultures. So I never accept that Sigmund Freud is the father of psychoanalysis. Um, now Freud, who had a long medical training in Vienna, was also in his way an interdisciplinary artist. He did not just work in the narrow confines of the consulting room. He studied anthropology, archaeology, myth, literature, and art. He collected ancient artifacts and antiquities from China, India, Egypt, and Greece, and Rome, and he introduced them to his family at the dinner table at night. These antiquities were part of the family, statues of Vishnu, Athena, Isis, Zeus, Artemis, Eros, the god of love. He draped his couch on which his patients free associated. He encouraged them to speak without internal censorship, just to, not to, not to, he, he wanted their first thoughts, not their third, not, not, um, any other kinds of thoughts. He didn't want any of us in this room to try and be coherent and speak in order. We could just let it happen on that couch. But he draped it with a magic flying carpet. It was a rug from Iran made in glowing colors woven with peacocks and plants and deer. And the carpet in his consulting room kind of made an otherworldly atmosphere. Because you have to remember, he was born in Vienna, where it snowed. There weren't sort of glowing, kilom, uh, glowing woven carpets on most people's, on most doctors' uh, furniture. So he's sort of thinking, thinking this through. What will relax the mind? and let the thoughts flow freely from all of us. 
So his was the first European systematic approach to making coherent sense of the unconscious. But Freud always believed that the poets and artists got there first. He showed us, amongst others, how dreams uncover something our unconscious wants to share with us. Dreams exist in the first place because we don't want to know what we know. And I've written a book called Things I Don't Want to Know. So the things I don't want to know are not just sort of uh, facts like if you put rubber bands in the fridge, they last longer, or that there are eight insect legs in every chocolate bar, um, or, um, think, or, that, or a shark is the only fish that can blink. They're the things we push down. We, they're too awkward. They're too shaming. They're just too difficult for our conscious minds to process. So we push them down. We don't want to know them, but we do know them. Dreams often express our true feelings and not the ones we're supposed to be feeling. What cannot be said easily is often revealed in a dream. Dreams can reveal the truths that have been dodged. So the dream is the bearer of the dreamer's desire. And desire in French is a great force, it means a great force, a great longing. We can wish for something, and we can wish something away. So I'm going to just read the first page of my novel, Swimming Home. And, um, Swimming Home is set in the south of France, in Nice. And I used to go there quite a lot to write, just for three days, because only an hour from London, and it's sunny. And, um, and I love to swim in the Côte d'Azur, the sea, which was a strange... Which if anyone's ever been there, you'll know that the sea is a kind of chalky, strange, dreamy turquoise doesn't look like a real sea. It's very near the airport. There are aeroplanes flying above it. And I never ever seen a, a single fish in that sea, which always makes me think that the sea is hiding its inner life from me. And maybe there's a beast underneath it or something like that, you know, because I've never swum without seeing any kind of life in the ocean. And I was swimming one day, far, far out, and then I turned round to face the town, treading water in the sea. There were three lanes of traffic. The sky was very blue. And I looked up, and all the rooftops were covered in snow. And I said, no, that's, that can't be true. That just can't be true. Sunny. And I looked again, and I realized that it was seagulls, those white feathered screechy birds, thousands of them all on the rooftop. And what came to mind was something that Salvador Dali had said about Magritte, which was that um, every one of his images looked like a hand-painted dream photograph. And I thought, I'm going to write a book like that. I'm going to write a book that's a bit like a hand-painted dream photograph. And I'm going to, it's called Swimming Home. Is it possible? Can we swim home? Where is home? How long will it take? Is there dry land? Here we go. Here's the first, here's the first two pages. We're in the south of France. It's July 1994. It's midnight, and we're on a mountain road. Uh, in the car is a young woman called Kitty Finch. She's about 23, and she's driving. And sitting next to her is a middle-aged British poet, a famous poet called Joe, who was born in Poland, Josef 
So he slides between two identities. He's got two names, Joseph and Joe. When Kitty Finch took her hand off the steering wheel and told Joe she loved him, he no longer knew if she was threatening him or having a conversation. Her silk dress was falling off her shoulders as she bent over the steering wheel. A rabbit ran across the road and the car swerved. Joe heard himself say, Why don't you pack a rucksack? and see the poppy fields in Pakistan like you said you wanted to. Yes, she said. He could smell petrol. Her hands swooped over the steering wheel like the seagulls they had counted from their room in the Hotel Negresco two hours ago. She asked him to open his window so she could hear the insects calling to each other in the forest. He wound down the window and asked her gently to keep her eyes on the road. Yes, she said again, her eyes now back on the road. And then she told him the nights were always soft in the French Riviera. The days were hard and smelt of money. He leaned his head out of the window and felt the cold mountain air sting his lips. Early humans had once lived in this forest that was now a road. They knew the past lived in rocks and trees, and they knew desire made them awkward, mad, mysterious, messed up. To have been so intimate with Kitty Finch had been a pleasure, a shock, an experiment, but most of all it had been a mistake. He asked her again to please, please, please drive him safely home to his wife and daughter. Yes, she said, life is only worth living because we hope it will get better and we'll all get home safely. So what does it mean, this pushing down of everything we know? Well, there's sort of clinical words for it, you know, repression, suppression, and every piece of fiction explores repression, the things that characters don't want to reveal. Um, because when we write, we're revealing and we're concealing things all the time. But I really like Sigmund Freud's answer um, in 1909 when he went to America to try and describe this avant-garde science of the unconscious to people who didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Um, someone said to him, Sir, Professor, uh, what, does a rep what, what is a repression? And Freud had a really great answer. It was so theatrical. Um, he said, OK, let's say that you in this audience, someone here, you, you don't like what I'm saying. So you start to shout, you start to heckle me, and I try to speak over you, but you just keep going until I ask this person to take you out of the room. And uh, you, you're escorted out of the room, and the door's closed, and just to make sure you don't come back, we put a, a chair, and then another chair against the door, and I continue to speak. But this troublemaker, he's out there, he's, he's knocking. All the, I'm trying to speak, and he's knocking like this on the door. And Freud said, that's a repression, that knocking. And so we all know we have that in one way or another every now and again. That's happening, isn't it? Just thoughts we don't want to think, or something we said the night before push it away. So a brilliant, really brilliant theatrical performative um, way of explaining what a repression is. And there's a lot of that in books. We want to know. That's what that keeps us turning the pages, doesn't it? 
Who is it? What is it? So writers who don't sort of construct that, for me, I don't really want to continue with the book. Who done it? Who's there? Why is it getting louder? That sort of thing. So when we talk about um, creating suspense or um, mystery and indeed clarification of a mystery, that's the sound I have in my head um, when I design a narrative, design a story. Just one other um, interesting fact about Freud. It's to do with culturally translatable internal conflicts. And it's to do with uh, my teaching in India at the National Institute of Design. Um, I was teaching writing in Ahmadabad and Gujarat. So, in 1910, Sigmund Freud conducted an extensive psychoanalytic study of Leonardo da Vinci's obsession with the mechanism of flight. And he used da Vinci's notebooks as sources. Now, Leonardo is, of course, most famously known for his painting, uh, The Mona Lisa. But when you look him up on Wikipedia, he's described as an engineer, which I really like. I wish I was an engineer. I'd like to be described as an engineer. And then they say, and she wrote some books. <laughs> so Leonardo thought that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Leonardo thought that the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. And he thought that art is never finished, it's only abandoned. So that's the 16th century. He's a, he's a modern man. Leonardo da Vinci was born out of wedlock in 15th century Italy. So it's 15th century Italy. His father was a notary and a landlord. His mother, Caterina, was believed to be a local peasant. So his parents never married each other, and the young da Vinci lived with his mother until he was five years old. And Leonardo da Vinci had a dream when he was around three, and he wrote it down in his notebook. He's lying in a cot in a crib. The window is open. A bird flies in. It settles on the edge of his crib, turns round, it's got very long tail feathers, and it starts to beat the little boy's lips with his feathers. Then Leonardo da Vinci uh, becomes, grows up, and he becomes obsessed with flight. How can I fly? How can I invent a flying machine? And he takes little balls of wax, and he blows it up, and he watches how it rises and how it falls. Then he starts uh, in his, in, you know, in his late, I'm making this up actually, in his late 20s, I don't know, he might have been younger, to design flying machines. Um, he's, he's got bats' wings in mind and birds' wings in mind and he straps them on his body and he always tries to take off and he falls down. Well, I took the story of Leonardo da Vinci with me to the National Institute of Design because at the time I was a fellow at the Royal College of Art, London, where I was teaching animation students script writing. And the National Institute of Design is the sister college of the uh, Royal College of Art's animation department. And I used this dream as a starting point to make stories. My students made up wonderful stories for this boy called Leonardo. They made him live in a world of failing crops, hauntings and possessions, cholera epidemics, wise trees, statues that come to life, 
fish that make prophecies, inanimate objects and non-human creatures invested with the capacity to think, feel and speak. But what was really interesting was that students from remote rural villages, others from the metropolis, there were 36 Indian languages in the room between us. All these students unknowingly came to the same narrative conclusion that Freud, born in Vienna in the snow, eating Florentines, these sort of pastries made from nuts and chocolate, all these students came to the same conclusion that Leonardo's obsession with flight was motivated by his unconscious wish to fly back to the father who had abandoned him in his infancy. So we see how that internal conflict had flown from from Vienna all the way to Gujarat. I didn't, uh, I didn't offer up that interpretation. That would be a stupid thing to do. But that was what came back at me. So I began to think of narrative um, as a sort of migrant. You know, it can fly f through time. It can fly through borders. Those cultural... Uh, Tra culturally translatable conflicts that um, also appear in our dreams. Finally, uh, writing fiction, even the most esoteric writing, it seems to me resembles a thriller and it has some uh, correlation with a dream structure too, which I know sounds contradictory because dreams go all over the place, but so does a thriller. And the classic structure of a detective novel follows Freud's archaeological metaphor quite closely. Dig, dig, dig. Bring up the broken pieces of the past. Fit them together. There will always be missing pieces in the story. So, say in an Agatha Christie, a crime or a murder is committed. There are a number of suspects who have secrets to conceal. A detective is employed to figure who done it. The detective is looking at motivation. He or she is climbing into the mind of the murderer, looking for motivation. And as the story unfolds, some of these secrets will be revealed. So the classic structure is for the detective to gather all the suspects together at the end and point his finger at the guilty party. And our pleasure as the reader is to have got there before the detective with lots of false trails on the way. And I believe that our dreams sort of get there wherever there is, before we do. And that's why we should pay attention to them. Italo Calvina told us, the Italian writer, writing always means hiding something in such a way that it is then discovered. And that would really have a correlation with um, dream interpretation. The Surrealists meditated on poetry, freedom, and love, desire seen by the poet and futurist Apollinaire um, as the authentic voice of the inner self. So in a dream, there's always a story we haven't bargained for. A dream can express our true feelings and not the ones we're supposed to be feeling. They give us new eyes on a situation. Have I got two minutes to read, or are we done? Well, I think anyone would kill me if I said no. Oh. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm just going to wind up before we have a conversation. I'm going to read um, a few pages from my collection of short stories called Black Vodka. And I'm going to read, I think I'm going to read a story called Roma, just because it's got a dream in it. So you spell Roma, R-O-M-A, and it's the capital of Italy, right? Sometimes it's very nice to have a break from the speaker's voice, isn't it? Just have a bit of silence. I often think about that when I hear people talk. I think I'm really sick of their voice. <laughs> Roma. Her husband, who is going to betray her, is standing outside the city of Roma. She is talking to him over the wall because she is not invited inside. She says, you've broken my heart, in the way an actress might say it. Standing by the fountain in the center of Roma is the woman who admires her husband. She walks past him in jeans and trainers. Her neck and cheeks are flushed. When she wakes up from this dream about her husband betraying her, the traitor is lying by her side. A radio in the room next door announces that the Federal Reserve has dropped interest rates in the USA and European markets are expected to follow suit. She puts her hand here and there on her husband's warm body and tells him nothing about her dream. In five hours, they will be out of the British weather. They will spend four days in Portugal and then return to the UK for Christmas. Their bags are packed, a cab will call for them. The lodger in the next room, Mr. Patel, is the man who listens to the radio all day long and he has bought her a present for the trip, a slab of Ayurvedic soap made from 18 herbs. It has been raining in Portugal for three days and nights. She walks down to the sea with her husband. The drenched succulents and rotting fishing boats have the same atmosphere of betrayal she experienced in her dream. Her husband takes a photograph of the two birds in the mud while she holds his bag for him. He comments on how pleasant her hands smell she tells him it's the soap that Mr. Patel gave to her and that he should try it too. That night, they eat in the Café Emigranti, a shack restaurant in the poorer part of the village. Their hotel room is not a place that invites intimacy. The cold marble floor, the thin blankets that are not warm enough for December in the Algarve, the two single beds pushed together. She finds Roma once again in her dreams, and it is a warmer place to be. The river is full of stars in Roma. Baroque water flows over rocks and stones. Her husband, who is going to betray her, sits at a table with his admirer, eating almond Easter cakes iced white in the shape of small bells. His admirer is strong. Desire has made her strong. Her skin is tanned. Her eyes and hair are black. She shakes the three green bracelets on her wrist and says, I have thought about what you have to say and it's interesting. His wife watches them from the other side of the wall He's in love, she thinks. She knows he's trying not to be in love. I'm going to leave you, I'm going to tease you, leave you, leave you there. Thank you.
for that, Deborah. I think you are, um, despite maybe not have been given the label, indeed an engineer. <laughs> um, so Deborah had a request at the start, and I think we'll, we'll try to accommodate that. Does anybody have a contribution they'd like to make to the Museum of Childhood? I was awoken in the middle of the night by two conspirators wearing black. They took me out of my room into the underground passageway covered in stones. They asked me, can you still do it? Can you do it? Come on. And suddenly I see my hand in front of me and I'm focusing very, very hard. Heat begins to build and a perfect flame erupts from the tip of it. And then I wake up. So in my dream, you know, I'm just falling and falling and falling. It's a recurring dream, something that I get probably like once or twice a week for like the last 20 years. And uh, you know, just falling, falling, you know, staircases are dissolving below me. Elevators disappear, escalators disappear, and I'm just falling. You know, and that's a recurring dream. So that's something that I like that. Yeah. Any childhood dreams? Just. Your memory of this, looking back and seeing the seagulls really resonated with me because my childhood dream, which is also a recurring dream, was that I'm swimming away. And I look back at the beach. All my family are there, and they're waving to me. Come, come. And I'm just swimming away, and I keep going. <laughs> swimming home. Swimming home. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> away from home. <laughs> swimming away as fast as you can get. <coughs> Go, yeah. Well, it's that question of where home is. <laughs> Do we have one more? Should we have one more? I had a, a childhood, a repetitive childhood dream. Yes. Uh, and I would uh, be shrinking. I'd be in my bed and I would shrink and shrink and shrink until I was very tiny and lost in my quilt, eider down. And then the walls would become honeycombed, like a, mm. like, like a honeycomb and I would be uh, struggling, I'd be very tiny and struggling in the quilt. Yeah. You, you have a childhood dream. Yes, we're, we're, we're we talking. talked about this, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, because I spent a few years away from my, from my family studying and for all of those years, I had a recurring dream of, of an earthquake and there being a split in the ground and them on one side and me on the other. And as soon as we were together, I never had that dream again. So, yeah. <laughs> there are no stupid dreams. Oh, yeah. I'm knocking at the door. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, a few contributions from Singapore thank, for your thank museum. You, thank you, Museum of Childhood, Singapore. So I'll kick off them with a question and then we'll open it up to all <coughs> of you. But, um, so I apologize, we're at an awkward angle here, so I'm sorry that we've got our backs to you a little bit. Um, so is the dream the beginning of an inquiry, or is there an answer in the dream? Every dream, it, you know, I, one couldn't really, really answer that specifically, because dreams come out of real things in the world, and uh, it depends what's going on. And although in the uh, extracts that I've read you today, I've sort of honed in on, a, on dream sequences, I, I have to reassure you that all my work is actually very kind of, you know, it's very rooted in everyday realities, but it honors, it honors um, all the dimensions, I hope, this is, this is my aim as a writer, to honor all the dimensions of consciousness, all the ways we, we make sense and nonsense mm. of stuff uh, that happens to us. So I suppose my own manifesto is to never flatten or sanitize things that are awkward or a bit shaming or a bit mm. uncomfortable because I believe that these are the most <laughs> interesting things. Mm. Uh, I could listen to everybody's dreams in this room. I've <laughs> if we had another two hours, we could do a great book. You know, um, just one other thing. 
Uh, when my daughter was five, she came back from school and she said she had a lump in her throat and that um, it felt real, that it had a physical reality. You know, it hurt. She said, like a pencil sharpener, something like that. This went on for a while. And um, when I got to the bottom of it, it turned out that she was being bullied in the playground mm. at school by a, a very pretty little girl, but, re but really quite badly bullied, you know. So I went to the teacher and we sorted it out and it all ended well. And the lump in the throat disappeared. Mm. So where the mind, the mind can do anything. The mind can make a lump in the throat and it will feel real. So when I was teaching at the Royal College of Art, I was telling my students about this. And one lovely male student, you know, this idea that women are more in touch with their feelings. I've never thought that was true. And indeed, it was a male student who um, said to me, oh, I've had a lump in my throat all my life. I can draw it for you. And he just got out his pen like <laughs> art students do. And he started to draw the slump like this. And it had depth. Like some of it, he, you know, he divided it into sections. And then all my students started to do it. Like we were, had things to do, you know. I had to get them to finish their scripts, sign off their scripts. They had to start shooting, but no. They were all drawing all the lumps in their throat. And I thought, we could do this in every single place in the world. And we could call it Museum of Lump of the Throat. Museum of, how would we word it? Museum of the lump in the throat. I'd go to that show. Would you? Yeah. Um, for the writer, the use of the dream, um, do you see that as, as a convenient technique for going to those difficult places then for writers who, because we know we have a lot of people that you know want to go to a place but then stop themselves. What if, what if the reader will hate this? What if they won't take this journey with me? What if it's too difficult to get them there? So the dream is a device. Yes, maybe in a first draft, just to make it a bit easier in the first draft, because I think the challenge would be really, we remember how I started and Alice mm. w woke up and it was all a dream. I'm still upset about that. <laughs> so, so, we keep that in mind, you know, we have to be brave enough to find a kind of formality maybe in the writing yep. that can allow us to, to travel through the soft interior universe. Um, there are as many stars and galaxies there as there are in the, in the actual sky. But then we don't want to be too cute about this too, because when we read, we want stuff to happen and we want, there have to be consequences, because what's interesting about reading, isn't it, is, is, is the risks that people take, what, what's at stake in the story. And so if it's just a dream, that feels a little bit like a cop-out, you know, mm. because it, it doesn't have consequences. So, so we how, keep how that in mind. How do you know mind. when that's the right thing to use then? So that it doesn't feel like a cop-out for the reader or the writer? Um, I guess you just begin to know that you, you honor the truth of the book, mm. you know, the internal truth of the book. So that story, Roma, why I said Roma is spelled R-O-M-A, mm. it was only years after I wrote that, well, actually, I only wrote it two years ago, but that I realized what Roma spells backwards. Amora. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> A more love. I didn't know that when I when I wrote it. So you know, there, there's there's a conversation between the conscious and the yeah. unconscious. I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. We've got a few minutes left, and so does anybody have a question for Deborah? If you do, just pop your hand up, and we'll get a mic to you. Yes. Can we get a mic to the gentleman? Hi, Deborah. Congratulations on a great talk. We, we enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, just to put, uh, you know, I mean, you, you're glamorizing dreams and, you know, you, you wrote, uh, you know, uh, you wrote books over it and you, you've enunciated yourself very well. But at the end of the day, 
trillions and trillions of dreams have come and gone in people's over the years in, hum, in the collective human minds, and uh, they mean nothing. You know, most great things happen in the waking state. They could just be frivolous and meaningless. So could you spare your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's a yes or no answer. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that uh, for one single second that all dreams are incredibly uh, important or relevant. They are only as important or relevant as you make them. Mm. So in the end, you your own uh, interpreter. And you might say, oh, that was a load of rubbish. <laughs> or that was frivolous or, or something like that. And you know, we haven't talked about nightmares, have we? Mm. Why haven't we? I wonder why. At the door. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the knocking at the door. Well, yes, maybe someone you love will walk through the door or something. So a zombie. I don't know. But we haven't talked about nightmares, and that's a whole other, that's a whole other talk. My daughter said to me before... Um, I left for Singapore. She knew I was going to be giving this talk. She's 16. She said, I dreamt I was swimming and I had a shark's fin on my back. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, did that help you swim faster? She said, yeah, I could just swim as far out in the sea as I liked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's not really the most important thing. you know. What is important are collective dreams that we have for each other and for the world. Um, that's very important, as we know. Um, and there will be very different cultural translations, interpretations of dreams. Any ideas why the muse's eye uh, sh spectacle shattered? I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't think you're meant to. No. <laughs> any other um, any other questions for Deborah? Yes. Um, okay. It's right behind you. Okay. There you go. Thank you. <clears throat> in terms of interpretation, in, in Freud we can see like two ways of going and at it. And in general, one is more um, with the idea of symbolism, that there is like an intrinsic meaning to some objects for, due to their shapes, for example. And that our task then is kind of, if we want to, um, discover that meaning that is intrinsic to that object that we have included in the dream. The other vertient or way uh, that <clears throat> I think at the end was more important for Freud was uh, interpretation in a free way, association, that it was based on the meaning that that had for you. And, but the interesting thing about that was that it was due to the playfulness of the language. Like you express it with Rome and Amor. Um, that we got to the meaning due to, if, if we explore this playfulness of the language. Of course, like Lacan took that to a different level. Uh, but I wonder if um, you, you find that um, going one way or the other, or both, in trying to interpret a dream, uh, give you different results in terms of creativity of a text, in a text. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. because it would be so boring, wouldn't it, just to live in this dream world <laughs> all the time? So sometimes, sometimes, you know, <clears throat> I'll give you an example of um, of a dream interpretation, like a classical Freudian dream interpretation, but it's kind of interesting, and I think you'll like it. So. This is what happened, really. I was in my house in London. I, I was working in the attic. I was writing. There was nobody in the house. This is not a dream. This is what happened. I was writing in the day. And 
I felt the door open uh, behind my chair, and I thought a cat had walked into the room. And it was a burglar who had got into the house through the window. And he had a sort of hood over his face. I didn't see him at all. He, it was, he was shocked to find someone in the room. He m moved to the side. I just saw this blur. And I ran, screaming, down the stairs, down the stairs, down the stairs, opened the front door, ran to my neighbors, called the police, and all of that. And he was gone. And then that night, I had this dream that um, I was four years old, and I was following my mother ac walking across a field, and she was heavily pregnant. And I had my nose in the air in the dream, like, you know, sort of like really defiant in the dream. And um, that was it, just following her, and she was pregnant. Then. Uh, I thought about this, and I realized that this was a very primal dream because my mother was heavily pregnant, I was four, and she was pregnant with my brother, who was four years uh, younger than me. He was literally in life, four years younger than me. So it was a bit like my brother was the thief. He was going to steal my mum. You know? So you can use... You, that. that that's how I saw that mm. uh, dream. But you know, it could just be meaningless too. It could just be nothing. It doesn't matter. Scribble them down. <laughs> Scribble them down and work through. I think it's interesting. I'm sorry, I know I saw a few hands go up and I'm sorry we've run out of time. Um, but you know, there is a very packed program for the festival and I know a lot of you will be moving on to other things as well. So we want to make sure we accommodate that. So we will call time on the questions now. I think what's interesting is that we began um, with a little anecdote about how you discovered Alice in Wonderland was just a dream. And yet we've had this incredible discussion for the past hour about how things aren't really just a dream, how dreams aren't really just those things. Um, so I hope you've all enjoyed the discussion. I hope you've all um, enjoyed hearing from Deborah. I certainly have, and I've learned a lot over the course of the last hour for sure. Thank you to the National Arts Council for organizing um, this among um, what is quite an incredible um, lineup for the festival. And thank you so much, Deborah, because I know it takes a lot to share quite openly um, when we delve into that, that place back there. So thank you very much. Deborah will be signing books downstairs. Um, so if I could just ask you all to just give her a minute to make her way down there, and then, and then you, can, you can storm her. And those of you who haven't had a chance to ask a question might be able to do so then as well. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here.